My best friend, Autumn, was an avid cyclist and it was her passion. She was living in Seattle at the time, going to naturopathic med school and was cycling back and forth pretty long distance to school and back every day. And one day on her way home, she was coming, she was going pretty fast down a pretty steep hill and a truck did not yield to her and he pulled out in front of her. And it was instant and, and terrible and a mistake and a, you know, a tragedy that should have never happened if people were obeying traffic laws. It would have, it would have never happened. Um, and so that fear for me of, you know, it's a risk every day to get on your bike. And even somewhere there where everyone cycles and, and most people obey the traffic laws. I mean, here, people don't. The cars don't obey the traffic laws. The cyclists don't obey the laws and neither do the pedestrians. And so I'm, I'm shocked every day that there's not more lives claimed that way here in New York. It's shocking to me. Late last year, the Department of Transportation decided to rearrange the bike network and remove a very critical piece of the Bedford Avenue bike lane. This piece is the piece that actually gets people from Flushing Avenue, which is a very busy street, to the Williamsburg Bridge. I should say that the Williamsburg Bridge is the most popular bridge for biking in New York City by far. We have more people crossing that bridge daily than we have riding almost anywhere else in the city. So this connection point is really key for safety. New York City put down a lot of bike lanes um, in an attempt or an effort to take a step towards a more bike friendly city. Um, Bloomberg, I guess most people believe in an attempt to sort of um, secure the voting block of the Hasidic community, made an agreement to get rid of this particular stretch of bike lane um, in order, you know, to get reelected, I guess. That's what people think. Bedford Avenue bike lane should and has to be removed for safety alone. The bikers totally ignore the law. So when you start stepping out on the street and you look in this direction because it's a one-way street, the next thing you know, the biker comes this way. Bicycle lanes save lives. So the city's analyzed deaths, more than 225 deaths at a time of bicyclists, and only found one death that occurred in a bike lane. So we know that a bicycle lane is a statement to the city, but also to bicyclists that you have the right of way. So removing a bike lane, knowing that we're trying so hard in the city to encourage bicycling, is really counterintuitive and also wrong. I think there was a, a, a portion of the bicycling community that wasn't interested in waiting for that dialogue to happen, that they felt that this bike lane should not be taken away. And they did a direct action. The idea of direct action is you go out and you, you implement what it is that you want to happen. You don't write letters about it. You don't passively sit by and wait for politicians to give you something. You take it yourself. And if it's right, then it's right. And I think the idea of this action was, this is clearly right that this bike lane should exist. It's for safety. The bike lane on Bedford Avenue is, is a one-way artery for motorists that have, are using this Bedford Avenue to get to the bridge for 20, 30, 40 years. There's nowhere where to put these bikers to make them safe from pedestrians walking into them or them hitting pedestrians. It's just not that avenue. It's, it's putting a bike lane on 57th and Madison. You can't, because people are continuously crossing and cars are continuously making left and right turns. So when that pedestrian is used to, he'll step out, look at the walk or no walk sign, and then start proceeding. And if he hears a car, he stops but all of a sudden doesn't hear the bike. And this happens periodically. 
it puts everybody in danger. The argument of the bike lanes on Bedford is so complex and so complicated because there's so many issues at hand. I mean, the fact that there's no bus stops, the fact that there's no speed limit signs, there's, there's so many things that need to become a part of the infrastructure for the whole community that don't exist. Um, the bike lanes should be there. There should be bike lanes on every busy road because the cyclists are going to use that road regardless. But for everyone to be safe, for the cyclists to be safe and the kids and the community and cars, people, everyone has to do their part of just obeying the traffic laws. I think the idea that it's a safety concern is ridiculous. I think that that is not the real reason at all. If they were so concerned about safety, maybe they would campaign to have cars pulled out of the neighborhood too. I think that cars, buses, trucks pose a much greater risk of physical harm than a bicycle. And I haven't heard many uh, many stories of Hasidic children being run over by bicycles that it should be that some safety concern. Well, I don't know exactly why the bike lane is so unwanted by the Hasidic community. I've heard that it has something to do with uh, scantily clad bicyclists riding through the neighborhood. I don't know if there's any real basis to that or whether that's just some rumor that somebody started. On the question about morality, let me be as blunt as I can make this. There was one stupid moron who is absolutely an imbecile that made a statement in public that the problem is with the dress code of the women. If you take a look at the guy who said this, should really be in a zoo. I have no better words for this guy. The modesty thing is a real issue. I mean, you can see how their woman walk around when they have outsiders coming in. They're, it's a direct threat to that. Also, when the men are driving by on their bikes, they are looking at the woman and they feel a little exposed in their community. So like normally they just go about their day in this very closed environment. Now all of a sudden they're looking at people, people are looking at them, there's that exchange going on. I've often wondered what they think of me and um, my roommate as well. She has red hair flowing down her back and is very boisterous and I we wonder sometimes because we definitely stick out and I have to hope that they don't judge but I think I think for the most part they just look away because it's so opposite of what they believe I don't know if they judge I would assume that they do but I've, I've often wondered. I've often wondered, especially when I see um, a group of the young women, you know, with many children, and maybe they see us, and kind of we represent something that maybe is wrong to them, or unholy in some way. But I'm not sure. I would, I would love to know what they think. There's a Yiddish word called shtetl, which describes that small town Jewish living where the community is totally comprised of like-minded people and it's closed off from the outside world and they may penetrate into the outside world for business purposes or to make a living but are very resistant to the outside world coming into their community to spread culture or ideas. Well, the Ten Commandments were given, and if you're an observant Jew, then it's the Ten Commandments. It's not made for people or leaders to bend or break. Because when you start bending a tree, the end of it, you're going to break it. The Hasidim and the ultra-Orthodox have lived their lives the way they have inherited it. From their parents, great-parents, great-grandparents. <coughs> which is what they have seen. And there's no rules to be bent. 
because if you start, there's no stopping. 